You're in uh, Exodus chapter 33. We're going to dig on in. Of course, today's Bible uh, Bible study, I believe, will be uh, one that uh, one that we definitely uh, we can uh, we will remember. Dare we say? Uh, and uh, you know, when you when you look at uh, the different things that really consume us nowadays, there, there's so many things that consume us. Uh, but we find something here that really consumed uh, Moses. Uh, right in the beginning of Exodus chapter 33. says this in Exodus 33 in verse 7. It says, Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of the meeting, tent outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. I mean, they were just watching Moses get ready to have this connection, this, 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 this time with God. Are you guys with me here? It says, as Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke to Moses. Prayerfully, the Lord spoke to you today. It says, whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they all stood and worshiped, each at the entrance of his tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young age, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. And the church said, Amen. you know, right here we see that Moses has a face-to-face -face connection with God. I mean, that's the only way you had to interact with, with God in the Old Testament if you were a priest. You, you would get the chance to, to, to connect with God and the priest would intercede for God between the people. And of course, God would speak to the priest the priest would speak to the people. That was the Old Testament. And the people had to be excited about that. They had to be fired up. They had to trust that, that the message from the priest was the message from God. Are you guys with me there? Yes. Yet we know that in the New Testament that we all are a royal priesthood. Yes. And that we all, as sold out disciples, Christians, are to intercede with God every morning. And, of course, God is making his appeal to a lost world through all disciples who are priests. And so we, we, we find it's, it's very important to see that the Old Testament is useful for teaching and rebuking, correcting and training. And the thing that's useful to me here and should be useful to you is Moses had a face-to-face -face time with God. People noticed his relationship with God. He had a conviction to make sure that he was connected to God. Amen. After all, that was the first relationship ever created on the face of the earth. God created man and had a relationship with him. Even before man had a wife, man had a relationship with the almighty God. And so we understand the, the most important relationship, really, is your relationship with God. Your connection to the almighty God. The church is not God. The ministry is not God. God is God. He isn't in heaven, and he is here now. He is, he's watching, and, and, and there we say we, we've all got to have deep, convictions about our relationship with God. Amen. Having that connection with the almighty God. Turn to Psalms chapter 63. All right. Go. Psalms 63. Verse 1. David. This of course is when David was in the desert. We understand when the Israelites came out of Egypt, they were in the desert. 
The Old Testament is the physical foreshadowing of the New Testament spiritual realities. Things that happen in the Old Testament physically happen to us in the New Testament spiritually. So after they came out of Egypt, they wandered in the desert. Of course, in the desert, they got bit with all kinds of snakes and scorpions and all kinds of things like that. Some people think wandering in the desert should be before you become a Christian. No, no, no. That's when you become a Christian. The wandering in the desert, the being bitten by snakes and the being tested by the Lord and not getting what you want and having to eat the, the wafers and all that good stuff and you want meat and God wants to give you... That, that's the Christian life right there. Right. And so David at this particular time is in the desert. He says this. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary. David says, when when, when I come to the sanctuary, I see God. I see God. Is that who you're here to see? Yep. Are you here to see God? To see what God has to say to you. To see God's people. Well, God's people got to be at the sanctuary on time if you're going to see God's people. Are you with me right there? It says, and behold your power and your glory. Your love is better than life. I mean, look at the David's heart. Your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my, my soul will be satisfied as with the riches of food. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. And the church said, one of the ways David showed he was close to God was his singing. Dare we say the individual who is not close to God is not singing. The Bible talk that is not close to God doesn't sing. The church that really is not having that face-to-face connection with God does not sing on out. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. all created to have a face-to-face interaction with God. We were all created to have that connection with God. And yet we get to Hebrews. Of course, the Hebrews were the, they were the Hebrews. They were the ones who knew the Old Testament. They, 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 They knew this stuff. They knew they needed to have that connection with God. But just because you know something doesn't mean you're doing it. Just because you believe in something doesn't mean you actually have deep conviction. You can honestly believe something and actually not believe it at all. Because belief biblically has nothing to do with intellect. It has to do with your deeds on top of what you believe. So if you don't have the deeds to evidence your belief, the Bible teaches you don't believe it at all. And this is a particular time where those who had, dare we say, been around a while, the Hebrew writer, whoever he was, (laughs) comes to them and says a few things to them. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 18. He says, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, And a storm. Well, that's talking about Mount Sinai when Moses would go to the mountain. I mean, God made it very clear. He put a fire and billow and smoke. He did not want all those other, other, other Israelites right there coming to him. He said, you can't do that. You'll be destroyed. I only speak face to face with Moses. And so the Hebrew writer has to help people understand that, 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 that's not, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about Mount Sinai where you can't have that face-to-face connection with God. Because in the New Testament, everyone gets to have that face-to-face connection with God. So he tries to tell them that right there. It says, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it beg that no further word be spoken to them. I mean, of course, that, that, that is the day we live in. 
People don't want to hear what God has to say. Postmodernism has seeped into our lives, and we say, well, for me, I believe this. When in actuality, when you say, for me, you, 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 you usurp the authority of the Almighty God. If he created you, he has created a plan for you. He has created an eternal truth. And the truth is absolute. It is completely absolute. That means if it's true for me, it's true for you. So there is no individuality where we get to create our own truth right there. John chapter 7 says, your word is truth. Yet they hear, were afraid of hearing the truth. Verse 20. It says, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches a mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying. Moses said, I'm trembling with fear. I mean, this with the fear of God in Moses when he was there at Mount Sinai. He says, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands in joyful assembly. Are you joyful this morning? Amen. To the church of the first Born. Firstborn means something. He just got through talking about Esau and how Esau was the firstborn, if you read earlier in the book of Hebrews. Firstborn is special. God can do something with the firstborn, yet Esau sold his birthrights for the world. You know, I look around at all the firstborn disciples in God's movement, God's modern day movement. Do you see yourself as the firstborn here in London? The firstborn disciples that will do something incredible, that will build Mount Zion right here in London. Firstborn is special. Yet Esau didn't see it that way because he didn't have a connection with God. He says, you have come to God, the judge of all men. Spirits of righteousness, of righteous men made perfect. To Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, sprinkled with blood. That speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. He says the, the blood of Jesus saves the blood of Abel. Huh. We know what happened with Abel right there. See to it that you don't refuse him who speaks. They did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth. How much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken. That is created things. So that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and let's not mix that on up. When he says a kingdom that cannot be shaken, he's talking about our eternal kingdom. <laughs> he's talking about heaven. Yes. Because the kingdom down on earth can be shaken. <laughs> God can shake up the kingdom. God can shake up a disciple. Sometimes you need to be shaken up. He needs to shake you and rattle you and get you to understand you need him. You guys with me here? Yeah. Verse 28, therefore, since we are receiving a king that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. And the church said, I mean, the Hebrew writer says you either get consumed with God or you get consumed by God. There's no other option. Our God is a consuming fire. Say, what's the title of the lesson? What consumes us nowadays? There's a lot that consumes us, right? Right. Some of us are consumed by sports. Some of us are consumed by our jobs. Some of us are consumed by our families, and those are good things. But you know the one thing that consumes every single one of us? The one thing that you probably even, you messed around with it today. You may have even be messing around with it right now sadly sometimes it's impacted you it's 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 in your life it has no race it has no color and if you're in my bible talk you better not give it away 
What consumes us all? Facebook. <laughs> the title of the lesson is Facebook. Facebook. That is the title of today's lesson, Facebook. Yet we're called to have that face-to-face connection with God in his book. Amen. You got to ask yourself, how long was your face in the book today? Or were you just in your own little world? Dare we say, my space. <laughs> Facebook. One man said he was using Facebook so much that his wife got jealous. His wife was so jealous he'd go on to his Facebook and he said, it's just getting ridiculous. My wife is so, I mean, it's just getting consuming. She's so jealous. The other day she looked at my calendar and she wanted to know who May was. <laughs> May. It's Michael Hart again, guys. says Michael Hart. One man said, uh, you know, Facebook can make you tons of money. All you do is go to your account settings, press delete, and then go get yourself a job. Oh. Facebook can make you a lot of money. <laughs> One can argue, hey, is the Internet good or is it bad? Well, honestly, it just depends on how you use it. <laughs> is a hammer good or bad? It depends. It depends. If you're part of a football gang and you're mad your team lost and you're on the tube and you got a hammer, probably a bad thing right there, amen? (laughs) But if you got a few repairs that need to be done on the house, bro, bring your hammer. Let's use it right there and build the house on up. Of course, the world uses Facebook all day long. And there are many tools in the world that can be used for bad, but we we, want to use the tools for good. Are you with me here? A few things you need to know about Facebook. One out of 13 people have a Facebook. One out of 13 people in the entire world have a Facebook. How many people is that? That's 500 million people on the earth have a Facebook. You know how big 500 million is? 500 million, if you took all 500 million and put them on a planet, it'd be the third largest planet in the universe, in the solar system. Dare we say there's a huge world that needs to be evangelized. 500 million. A few years ago, Microsoft wouldn't accept the word Facebook when you would go to a Microsoft Word doc and and, and type Facebook. They wouldn't accept it as a, a word. It wasn't a word. This is the largest, one of the largest companies in the world. But, of course, Microsoft goes back because Facebook is so consuming now, and they change it now when you type Facebook. They actually have a spelling edit right there for the word. It's, it's actually created. It, it's a new word now. It's just a part of what we do. Microsoft, we got to check Facebook. we got to make sure we get that there. 70% of Facebook users are outside of the United States. 70%. Facebook is valued at between $7 and $11 billion. Get this one. Women have 55% more posts on Facebook than men. I'm just reading the truth here. Six billion minutes are spent a day on Facebook. That's three billion photos that have been added a month on Facebook. Over 80% of businesses are consumed today with finding out how to use Facebook as part of their business structure. 80% of businesses. That's, these are stats worldwide, guys. 28% of people in this world check their Facebook before they get out of bed. They're laying in their bed. Facebook. From 2009 to 2011, Facebook was the most searched term on the internet. 48% of young people between the ages of 17 to 34, I think 34, maybe go to 39 right there. Uh, 
content. 17 to 34. Check their Facebook as soon as they wake up. What's the point? People are obsessed with Facebook. People are consumed with Facebook. People, 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 even, you may, you may have even looked at your Facebook. You're sitting in the sanctuary. The question we got to ask is, Jesus the most searched term on the internet? Do you lay there and go, I, 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 and, and in the bed and before, and you just grab that Bible and you open it on up and you get that scripture before you get out of bed? We're going to look at five things about Facebook that should be in the heart of every true disciple. Five things about Facebook that should be in the heart of every single disciple right there. You guys with me here? Number one, Facebook consumes us, and we need to be consumed with God. But not only consumed with being connected with God, but consumed with preaching the word of God. Turn to Romans chapter 1. What consumes you? What consumes your time? Are you consumed with the message? What I love about Paul the Apostle is... He was so consumed, he, he, just, he just lived a life that did not show he was afraid of man. You know when someone's not consumed with God, they're more afraid of people than they are of God. That's a person that's not been consumed with God, and you cannot be consumed with the message because you fear people more than God. And yet Paul feared God. And it says in Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 16, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Are you ashamed of the gospel? No. Yami isn't. He says, because it's, it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. He says, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Stop right there. Paul just got through saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the salvation for the Jew and for the Gentile. That's the entire world. He says you're only saved by the gospel. He says the Quran cannot save you. You're not saved by Muhammad, Allah, or any other God. You're not saved from Buddha. You're not saved from Confucius. You're not saved from any other man that sets himself up as deity. You cannot be saved. In fact, if you go to the tomb of Moses, or uh, uh, well, Moses, yeah, him too, but <laughs> Muhammad, his bones will be right there. <clears throat> Confucius, his bones will be right there. You go to the tomb of Jesus, make no bones about it. <laughs> it's empty. Do you believe that message? People who do not believe in the gospel are not saved. Period. If God took 50 disciples and put them on an island and 1 million people that were not disciples and put them on the same and took away the Facebook, took away the internet, took away every different thing, what would we have to go off of? And let's say he gave him a Bible, amen? For my analogy here. Amen. You'd only be able to go by the Bible. You couldn't get on the internet. You couldn't go find some other book. The only thing you would have to refute those who don't believe is the word of God. And that's all you would need. I talked to a brother. He goes, well, you got any good studies? Bro, do you believe in the scripture? Yeah, but can we just say it like that? Yeah, you're not consumed with the message. You're ashamed of the gospel. The gospel saves. The gospel brings unity. But the gospel brings division. What made Paul special is he was consumed with the message of God. He was not ashamed of what the Bible taught right there. Are you, are you ashamed of what the Bible teaches? If you're ashamed of what the Bible teaches, you're ashamed of God. You cannot be consumed with the message, or you cannot be consumed with God and not consumed with the message of God. Right. Let's keep reading. 
verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. He says right here, there, 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 there is a God. And there is no excuse not to believe in God. Because creation highlights there is a God. Verse 21. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of God, glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man, birds, animals, and reptiles. You find that on the internet a lot. People exchange the truth of God's word for what the internet says. Well, I had a great connection with the London International Christian Church, but let me go on to the internet. Let me exchange the truth of what I was taught by what the internet teaches. Let, let, me, let me do that and get sucked into that. What happens? Therefore, God gave them over to sinful desires of their hearts, sexual impurity, to degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They worshiped and served created th things rather than the creator, who is forever praised. Amen? Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for this perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind. He says, when, 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 once you stop feeling consumed, once you stop believing you need to be consumed by the word of God, your mind gets depraved. You start to sin in your mind. I mean, that's really where it, heart, where it starts. It starts in your mind and your heart. I mean, you don't, you know, the, the, the Bible teaches the heart is deceitful. Yeah. The Bible teaches that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the overflow of the heart, that's where the wickedness comes. It doesn't come by what you see. You thought about sinning before you saw what you saw. Because you can see that which is wicked, turn away and move the other direction. And then you can see and go, oh, wow, and get sucked on in. Your mind can begin to be depraved. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. Notice it doesn't say the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it says they are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil, like called an atheist church here in London, England. That meets at 10 o'clock right now in a church building. I mean, they're just saying we need, we actually need God. That's really what they're saying. That's what I believe. It says they disobey their parents. They're senseless, faithless, heartless, rootless. Although they know God's righteous decrees that those who do such things deserve death. They not only continue to do these things, they also prove of those who practice them. Wow. Is this not the world we live in? Yeah. Anything goes. Anything goes. Yet we see Paul preaching to the church. Can you imagine hearing this sermon by Paul the Apostle in Rome? Wow, that guy is he's consumed with the message of God. He doesn't fear men. What an incredible, incredible, incredible response to the grace of God. To be consumed with the message of God. Are you consumed with the message of God? Are you consumed? You know, I'm, I'm so encouraged about some, some, some of our churches around, 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 around the world that are just so consumed with really getting the message out there. And Paul was consumed because he understood people are lost. This, this scripture talks about there being a lost world. Do you believe the world is lost? Do you believe you are part of the firstborn here in London to save those who are lost? I'm so encouraged at what's going on in Los Angeles. Kip writes this. Yeah. Greetings from Los Angeles.
last Sunday, God blessed us with a record non-push attendance of 1,156 disciples, uh, a contribution of 33,572 U.S. dollars. During the week, the Lord added to our number six baptisms, two restorations, giving us a total of 50 additions in March. They're consumed right there. Jack Martinez writes, he, of course, he's in the church in L.A., but he leads one of the, the, the regions. He says, our Sunday servants featured an amazing contribution message from Big Ed Aguilar, as well as a heart-moving communion by Jason and Monique Aguilar, our two new disciples. They drive 100 miles round trip from California City every Sunday because they believe and are consumed that a church alive is worth the drive. Says, in fact, during a conversation with Jason and Monique, they shared with me that Jason had been talking for a while about his American dream of owning a huge house with a pool, a game room, and a man cave. <laughs> That's a place where men go and drink and be really bitter and stuff like that. Well, Monique just shook her head and told him, well, you can give that dream up, honey, because we need to be consumed by God. God has an ever-increasing and bigger dream than this house. And I'm going to be there to help you realize it. This brand new couple in the kingdom is already talking about going into the full-time ministry. And they both have the heart and the talent to do so. They're consumed by God. Willing to give up their dream for his dream. Do you want to go into the ministry? that the kingdom of God is built on everyone's dream. No, it isn't. The kingdom of God is built on men crushing their dream for God's dream. And what happens is people, though, they want their own dream, which is a flawed dream, because any dream that's not the dream of God, any plan that God hasn't planned for your life is a flawed plan. And so there's no, they're not consumed with it. Yet we see a couple soon as they're back, they're consumed. 100 miles they drive just to be at church. Yes, some of us come to church late, strolling on in. Oh, yeah, my phone's going off. Yeah. Where's the reverence for Christ? Where's the respect for the great calling, the mission? The fact that the Lord believes that you're the firstborn and you're the one he believes in. He wants to make his appeal through you. You know how it is. If we had tickets to a Man United game, we wouldn't come rolling in second half. We'd be there early with our popcorn and sitting there ready to go. <laughs> yeah, we come to church as if it's, and maybe that's what church is. It's just church and not the kingdom of God. Not the, not the, not the kingdom of God. Of God, are you consumed with the message? Of course, I love uh, what Raul Mareño has to say over there in Sao Paulo, Brazil. He says, When the Lord restored our fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Psalms chapter 126, verse 122. Greetings, brothers and sisters. We are full of joy as nine were added to the San Paulo church this week. Eight of them were placed memberships from our former fellowship, the ICLC sector of Artur Alven. Huge. Huge. Down in Brazil, God is, 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 is moving in a way that sat some of our brothers from our former fellowship, they, they just said, listen, we still believe in discipling. We still believe in making disciples of all nations in one generation. We still believe in one man leadership. And you know, we can't take this. We got to come and join you. And they joined Ra- Raul down there. It's awesome right there. Ron in Washington, D.C., consumed with the message. They're, they're, they're going after their special. So this weekend, our marriage raised 508 uh, U.S. dollars. The singles collected $676. Our amazing campus ministry gathered $1,844 in six hours for a total of $3,028 for the week. In the last three weeks, we've raised a total of $7,055 without selling anything, without draining our bank accounts, and without any upfront cost. It has simply cost us 16 hours of being consumed with tagging, bucket shaking. Many 
ask, how is this possible to give beyond your ability? As it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3, the DC disciples have answered this question by their unity, by their zeal, by their passion, being consumed with the message to God be all the glory. New York City. We're doing our second annual run for missions on George Washington Bridge, where we raised $1,000 and inspired even non-Christians to get consumed with our run and to run with us. (laughs) Today at service, the 108 New York City disciples had a record non-push attendance of 184 and have already collected 38,000 in advance of our fifty, or uh, in advance of our sixty-five thousand dollar goal for next Sunday. Is that consuming? Is that intense? Are, are they on fire for the Lord? Does that consume all your faith? Do you hear that and you go, "Okay, I don't have any faith anymore." Or does that get you excited? Like, wow! All over the world, disciples are consumed with getting the message out there. And it starts with your face in this book. You guys stay with me here. What else can you do with Facebook? You can add friends. Proverbs chapter 17. You can add friends. The question is what kind of friends? That's the question. What kind of friends? Do you want the kind of friends the Bible highlights? Proverbs 17 verse 17. Look at this kind of friend. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. He says, says, there are certain friends that are closer to you than your physical family. They stick close. I mean, after all, if you had a car, you were driving around London and you broke down, how many of those friends on Facebook are going to show up to help you on out? They're not going to. Uh, in fact, you probably don't even know half your friends because you never really met them. They've been suggested by a friend who has a friend who has a friend. And all of a sudden you see they have these people that are their friends. And you see that they're, okay, okay, they're friends with this person. Okay, they're your, your, I guess you're my friend. Yet there's no connection. We got to be careful with the Internet. The Bible teaches that they made a tower and they wanted to make a name for themselves in Genesis chapter 11. And it, 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 it was, it, long as it was to glorify God, amen. But when it became about them, God, God had to scatter their language. You know, the internet has given us the ability to actually have this entire, I mean, it's, it's changed the world, has it not? It has changed the world, but we, we, we better be careful that we use it to evangelize the world and it doesn't become the Tower of Babel for us. Check out this one. Proverbs chapter 26. You guys stay with me? Proverbs 27, rather. Check this friend out. Verse 5. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Got any friends like that? Got any friends that, that, that are willing to say the things that feel like a wound? But he says here, wounds from a friend can be trusted. Why does he say that? you get wounded by your friend and that's the first thing you start doing you don't want to trust they tell you things you don't like to hear especially in the kingdom of god you hear the truth and you ever done that somebody tells you something so convicting and you just start picking them apart yeah but how are you doing how's your marriage who you brought to church why is he telling me this Ah, you try. ah, and you just start picking them apart i've done that maybe it's just me But as soon as you hear the truth of the word, you can start mistrusting. And he says wounds from a friend can be trusted. But an enemy just... (laughs) Just got all the kisses you want. Oh, you're so loving. Maybe you want that kind of a church where they... You're so saved. You're so... You're so... Come in. God's grace. It's so loving. No commitment. We want to ask for your money. You're so awesome. You got churches like that. 
Yeah. You have people that got those kind of friends. They want those kind of friends. Yeah. Just tell you, you're awesome. You're amazing. You're special. You're incredible. You're stupendous. <laughs> no, God is all those things. We are lucky to be alive. Yeah. We are lucky to be Christians. You are lucky to be in the church. You need the church. Hey. Right. You want these kind of friends? You want to add these kind of friends? I love Paul the Apostle. Paul told Timothy, don't you be ashamed of me or the message. He told Timothy that. Why? Because Timothy started getting a little afraid because he, Timothy's following Paul. Paul's kind of crazy. A little bit. I don't know if you got a Paul in your life who's kind of crazy. Doppel's looking at me right there. That's my son in faith. I love Doppel. Jimmy was looking at me as well, so both of them. But you know, you got, God's going to put Paul in your life as a Christian. You can't be ashamed of him. How about it? You respect your leaders? You respect your leaders, male and female. The female Paul, God's put in your life. The male Paul, you respect them. Are you ashamed of their message? Because you know that that message is a challenging message. You're willing to add those kind of friends. See, to be in the kingdom of God, you got to have Bible friends. Amen. The friends that the scriptures talk about. Adding these kind of friends will save your soul. Adding these kind of friends can help your marriage. Adding these kind of friends will evangelize the world. Why, why did Michael and Maria Hart move all the way over from sunny Curacao where it's 30 degrees all year and it's incredible over here? Do they want to move over here just so they can ride the tube and get pushed around a little bit and be, uh, you know, freezing in March? <laughs> they moved here because they want these kind of friends. Amen. They want these kind of friends. I'm so fired up about George and Angelica Grima. You know, they came, they did a speech last week, and, and we're praying, okay, awesome, they're going to be here in the next, you know, month or so. They'll be here on Tuesday. They'll be here on Tuesday. God is just adding friends. He's just bringing them real friends, not Facebook friends you don't know. And George has been around a long time. Anybody who's been in Kip's Bible Talk back in 1979, that's a Christian that can help the London National Christian Church. You want to add these kind of friends? You know, one of the things that really built my faith is when I had that first friendship with that woman of God. I, I, I fell in love with our friendship. We began to build a friendship. Of course, that's with my lovely wife, Michelle Williamson, right there in the back. She's the first woman I built a godly friendship with in my life. I, I didn't know what that looked like. I didn't know how to approach and be in a relationship with a woman where I didn't get my needs met. Or, I mean, and Michelle was just super hard line. She, she was just very hard line. I'd, I'd be trying to dazzle her and, hey, look, I did, did this commercial and all that. She, oh, that's awesome. How's your quiet time? <laughs> For those that don't know, I was, I was in the entertainment uh, in, in Portland, Oregon, and in, in uh, Los Angeles, California. Did film, did TV, that type of thing. Michelle could care less. I mean, she was awesome, but she, it, it didn't matter to her. Hey, I'm, I'm going to do a movie. I'm doing another movie. Robert De Niro, I'm going to be in that one. She's like, that's, that's awesome. What you got coming on Sunday? Golly, this woman, what is wrong with her? Is she fired up about me? No, she's fired up about he. Are you building relationships, singles, with a brother who will call you to account on the scriptures? With a sister that's willing to tell you the truth from the word of God? You want that kind of friend? You know what will happen you get that kind of friend? You marry him. And you'll get godly offspring. You get godly offspring. You get you get children that are raised in a Christian home, where the word of God is the standard. See, on Facebook you can add all kinds of friends, but do you want those kinds of friends? Bible friends. I think some of us we 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 don't want these kind of friends. You you you, you especially some of the singles you 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 don't choose based on spirituality. That's what the world does. They look and they kind of do this type of thing and they all of this. And, then, and that's how they make their choice. And then they wonder why they're getting divorced and the divorce rate is 50%. Because the standard wasn't biblical. They didn't add the right kind of friends. Friends that fear God. 
Friends that put the scriptures over every single thing in their life that are guided by the scriptures. We've got to add more of these kinds of friends to the London National Christian Church. You guys with me here? What else can you uh, do on faith? You can block people. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 6. You can block. Sometimes you need to block people. You know how it's been. You've got on your Facebook and you're like, what in the world is this guy? Put, what is she doing there? And you just go, I don't want that. i got to hide that feed or, or whatever. It's got all the little gadgets on it now. It changes every other week with Facebook. <laughs> but you can block people. Yeah. And it's it's a Bible command. we got to block certain people from influencing our lives. Second Corinthians chapter 6. Check this out. Verse 14. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? What fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Bilal? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of idols, the temple of God, and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. I said, we are the temple of the living God. We, we are the temple, guys. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God. They will be my people. Therefore, come out. Be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I'll be a father to you, and you'll be my sons and daughters, says the Lord all. Mighty and the church said, Amen. You gotta block people sometimes. That's what that's what Paul's telling the church. He's saying you you gotta you can't be yoked together with unbelievers. Why? Somebody's gonna start believing what the other believes. And if you're yoked together with a non Christian, someone who doesn't believe, the Bible is the standard. And you're yoked, you're influenced, you're moved, you're, 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 you're persuaded by them more than the friends of God that have been added to your life. You're in trouble. You're, you're in trouble. I love my, my, my youngest brother. I love him to death. And I'll never forget, I became a Christian. And he had every negative thing to say about the church. It hurt me to the heart. But God had added all these other friends to my life. I was fired up about it because I needed them. I got sad because my own brother, who I grew up with, didn't want to, didn't want to, didn't want to hear the gospel. My own mother, she went against me. So, oh, I don't, I don't believe in that church. I don't believe in this. I don't believe in that. Mom, look at what the Bible teaches, and she went against me. I was so glad that God had added all the, the friends, and I. I it even got to a point where I had to block my own family members from influencing my life. Can you believe that? Yeah. Look at Satan. He's, he's wicked. He is evil. He, he, he's, a, he's not a fair fight. He's a street fighter. He'll use your family. He'll use your kids. He'll use your kids to turn you away from Jesus Christ. Because he doesn't care about your kids and he doesn't care about you. He hates you. He hates the fact that you're reading the Bible right now. He hates the fact that I'm preaching against him right now. He, he's ticked off at the church right now. He doesn't like it. That's right. Because he knows his time is short. Right. Revelation chapter 12. I had, I had to block my own family. It was, it was hurtful. But God had added all these other friends. I had to block people. I love our open mic night. Yeah. We had an incredible open mic night the other night, did we not? Yeah. Just Friday. It was incredible. Incredible talent. Singers, dancers. Uh, it just was amazing. Uh, seeing all the talent. I really believe we are going to have ourselves an AMS ministry here in London. Amen? You know, for those that don't know, we have many disciples that are that are actors, that are into entertainment, that are uh, one of the brothers. Uh, his name is Carl Buckner. Uh, he's uh, in L.A. I think he may be in Portland right now, actually. But he's uh, you may have seen on Facebook again his new album that's coming on out, uh, and it's really cool to see that. And we will have that here in London, England. Uh, but but we, we gotta we we gotta make sure. Turn to Malachi chapter three. We got we got to make sure of a couple of things here. And and having an AMS ministry, one of the things we we got to make sure we've got the right heart about the AMS ministry. AMS is art, media, sport. Folks that are artists, singers, dancers, professional athletes. 
Malachi chapter 3 in verse 18 says this says, and you will again see a distinction between the righteous and the wicked. Between those who serve God and those who do not. And the church said, if we're going to have an AMS ministry, there needs to be a distinction between us who serve God and those who do not. What am I talking about? Well, of course, this is my background. But one of the things that really made it, made it challenging for me, being in the entertainment industry, was all, all the wickedness that was there. And I, I had to just put my foot down, and a lot of commercials I couldn't do, a lot of things I couldn't do. I, I, it was a very clear, my agent says, listen, you know, she's just started getting, she, she knew what auditions to send me out on and which ones not to send me out on. She just knew. She knew Michael's not going to go do that. And I just, that, that was our relationship. So there was that. Uh, it's gotten back to me that we have disciples that want to build an AMS ministry, but you can't build an AMS ministry by being a part of the world. You've got to be separate. You've got to have a distinction. Uh, and it's gotten back to me. Yeah, we got disciples going to clubs. We got disciples hanging out by themselves. They're so strong in the Lord. They're so whoo, They're so hard line spiritually. And so they're hanging out in clubs. Uh, they're being so they're being the light of the world, walking in the darkness right there. Uh, and, and, and yet you call yourself a disciple. Where's the distinction in that? Am I saying that you're not going to be in a situation where there's drinking and this type of thing and you, you, you can preach the gospel? I'm not being legalistic. I'm talking about your heart. If we're going to build a great AMS ministry, we've got to eradicate this freedom in Christ mentality that we can hang out in bars, we can hang out in clubs by ourselves and do well spiritually. You are deceived if that's where you think you're at. You are deceived. You've got to be a distinction. And you may have all the friends in the world, but they may be the very friends you need to block. And just go, you know, I love God more than I love AMS. And I think we we, we got to be careful that there's a distinction. Even when we have our open mic nights on Friday, there's got to be a distinction in the fellowship. Well, we're bringing people out to perform, but we're getting in there to set up Bible studies, to talk to them about the Almighty God. Amen. What makes the AMS ministry crank and, and, and amazing in Los Angeles is they're baptizing people. Yeah. It's not just about, inter- let's just, you know, get together and just party like this here. Where's the distinction? We've got to have a distinction. We've got to have a distinction. Or God won't bless it. And it may mean you got to block some friends. You may need to block people in your life that really just don't, don't, don't want it. And I'm talking to a lot of us that are, a lot of you young people. I know it's challenging for you guys. I know it's hard. I respect you a lot. But you need to be a Christian. You need to make the tough decisions to block the people that are not going to help you get to heaven. Satan will use those folks to go after you. That's why Paul says, come out. That's why Malachi says, there's got to be a difference. People got to look at the disciples and look at those who are not and go, oh, man, there's a difference. There's just a distinct line between the two. You can be in the world but not of the world. See me afterwards if you want questions about that. But we've got to, we've got to block people that are stopping God's message here. Are you guys with me here? What else is there? There's a, there's a, you can, uh, Facebook has that button called the poke button. You know that? I don't know if you've seen it. You can poke people, you know. You've been poked on Facebook before. Someone sends you a poke and it goes, you know. It's kind of irritating, a little bothersome. It's like, what is this thing? What are you poking me for? Hebrews chapter 10. That little poke button right there. You may feel like they're just push, pushing your buttons, but, you know, amen. Hebrews 10. Check this out. says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. And the church said, Amen. of course, that spur is that little thing on the, most people think Americans are all like cowboys and stuff like that and ride horses and stuff. That's not everybody in America. That's actually not most of the people in America. Um, but we won't go into my American side of things right there. Uh, however, 
Uh, we know what a spur is. And when the cowboy spurs that horse, the horse just, whoa, giddy up, time to go. <laughs> and it goes right there. And yet, the Bible says we got to spur one another on. We got to disciple one another. We got to spur each other on. In Romans chapter 10, or chapter 12, it says, Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. In Romans chapter 16, just write these scriptures down. Romans 16, verse 16. It says, greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ sin, they're greeting. So when we give that side hug, that's where that comes from. We don't do the holy kiss, we do the holy hug. Amen. That's to encourage. And we greet people. That's why we go to the airport. That's why we'll be there Tuesday at 1030 to greet George and Angelica at St. Pancras Station right there. Amen. Amen. Because the Bible says you greet one another. And it will give them a holy hug, not a holy kiss. Galatians 5 says, you, my brothers and sisters, in verse 13, my brothers and sisters, we're called to be free, but don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, it says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as Christ forgave you. In Ephesians 5 verse 9, it says, Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. He says, you got to sing to one another. Can you imagine that? You're coming to Bible th- or D time right there with your disciples. Will you trouble come my way. Gotta pray sometime. Disciple says, there's a message that and true for the simple. Bring it out, bring it out. Da, 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 today. You start singing. Okay, well, the trouble came away. I need to go bring the message out. Amen. But yet the scriptures say that. And then in Romans 15, verse 14, it says, Myself, I'm convinced, my brothers and sisters, you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with the knowledge, and co- competent to instruct one another. What are we talking about? We're talking about poking one another. We're talking about discipling. Discipling. Correcting one another. Paul was confident that the disciples there, lastly, and he wrote most of those letters there, he was confident that they they could instruct one another. You know, one of the weaknesses we have, we've got a lot of strengths as a church, but one of the weaknesses we we, we can have is called people-pleasing. People pleasing. Well, we don't use the word of God to instruct one another. To instruct one another. We've got to, we've got to poke one another. We've just got to disciple one another. And we've got to do it with the word of God, not your opinion. I tell you, when you pull out the word of God and, 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 and you're a sister and a brother has done something to you and you go, Brother, um, can I read you this scripture right here? <laughs> It says right here, uh, there should not be a hint of impurity. And I know it's me and you hanging out alone together. And I'm not over you because the Bible doesn't call me to be over you. But can you help me understand the scripture in relation to this dynamic right now? (laughs) If you're like me, you'll turn beet red. You couldn't tell I was red. I'm dark complected. It was more like a burgundy right there. So sister told me that one time. I was just, yeah, I said, yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was, I was, I was uh, you know, the demons start coming out. I was, I was, I was, you know, you jam up like a computer or something like that. Uh. But you know what? We got our sisters. Some of you, 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 you talk to each other. And you gossip about the brothers. You won't talk to the brother. You don't love your brother. Here's some of your brothers. You don't disciple the sisters. You enjoy it. You don't get in there with the sisters and, and really speak to them with love and the scriptures and the Bible. We've got to instruct one another. Amen. And then lastly, discipling. God, God is set up. He set up discipling for a reason. The person that God has put in your life to disciple you is the one who disciples you. You've got to respect the command of discipling. The person who's in your life, they, they are competent to instruct you. Don't go over your discipleship partner. Don't go around them. I had to talk to a disciple this week. Well, I just wanted to go around my discipleship partner and go to you. Well, that, that, that's awesome. But 
We're all competent. We're all disciples. I say we're all disciples. And what will build this church is when we start instructing one another. We start getting in there with one another. And not only correcting, but spurring one another, believing in one another. I mean, have you went up to a brother or a sister and said, I see you as the leader of the AMS ministry. You can do it, brother. I see you starting a business where disciples all work for you. I see you as an incredible artist that's able to draw attention to God by your art. I see you as a, as a, as a businesswoman who can really go after some of these major events that women are coming and speaking. But you can be that Christian woman that we have there that influences some of the most powerful women in this city. I see that about you. Do we believe in one another? Do we spur one another on? Do we encourage one another? I mean, you got that little button called the poke button. Because we need to poke one another. We need to spur each other on. And lastly, the other thing about Facebook, and this is for those of you that are visiting. Would we be on Facebook if it cost you nineteen ninety five? Yeah, you wouldn't. No one would be. You would If they would have said, "Hey, 1995, you get Facebook," you would have not signed up. There'd be no one on Facebook. It'd be lost book. <laughs> the cool thing about Facebook is it's free. Isn't that interesting? It's free. And it's changed the world. Yeah. And yet, really. Jesus' blood is, is, is really, really having a relationship with God. Every one of us have access. And really, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't really, if we really talk about it, it doesn't cost you anything. Because we don't, this world is nothing. You brought nothing in, you brought nothing in, you take nothing out. You can sign up for a relationship with God for free today. Amen. You can sign up. If you come for the first time. I want to challenge you to question whether you're saved or lost. I want to challenge you to let the scriptures, even if you've been coming, you got to ask yourself, wow, have I, am I really a disciple? Am I really saved? Am I really right with God? God, God has given me a free opportunity here to turn myself on him. What made that prodigal son so amazing is he waved the white flag and came back and said, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing well. Help me on out. And God received him with joy. If you're visiting for the first time, I want to challenge you to study the Bible. I want to challenge you to study with the person who brought you on out and let the scriptures heal your heart and tell you where you're at. To God be all the glory.